This is Joel Bradley, and Joel says, Greeting Dr. Tyson, Dr. Shower, Lord Nice. Joel here from Geelong, Australia, and I have a question regarding our favorite pre supernova star, Beetlejuice. Mm. Ooh. Whilst I understand that life of a star is extremely long from our perspective, how is the time frame for Beetlejuice going to supernova between now and 100,000 years? Is there any sign that will warn us of it happening in our lifetime, or will we just look up one night and go, oh, wow, look at that. There oh. it was. There it, it is. Was. What's the life expectancy of Betelgeuse from birth S to death? Something like, a, uh, well, the star itself, yes. if you consider the main sequence lifetime, uh, probably a few million years. Got it. Okay. Okay. So it was hydrogen burning for a good fraction of its lifetime, maybe a million years, maybe two, three million Again, years. Uh, when it's and astrophysics speaking, it means hydrogen fusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course. Okay. So Betelgeuse. Uh, was initially as a very massive star fusing hydrogen into helium. Mm -hmm. Then it left the main sequence, ascended the red, and then the red supergiant branches. It ran out of hydrogen in the core. Ran out of hydrogen, needed mm -hmm. to do something else. Mm -hmm. Needed a new source of energy, otherwise it was, it was gonna collapse. The core got dense enough and hot enough for helium to start fusing into carbon. And helium has two protons in its nucleus. Oh. Now you gotta get two, two protons, protons next to two protons, you got to be hotter than whatever you were for wow, hydrogen. Look at that. Typically, you've got to be in the 100 million degree range instead of the 20 million degree range in order for that to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it is really hot down there in the core of Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse has only got probably in the best case, 100,000 years to go, mm. but it might be tomorrow. Okay. That's a really bad prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, can you do better? Can you do better than that? Fifty Michael? years ago, the prediction would have been, "We don't know why it's a red supergiant." Oh, okay. So, we, so okay. we have gotten a lot better. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yes, we okay. would love to do better. Uh, we, and the answer is, if we you should, we should appreciate how far we've come. If you give even me, in our ignorance, if you give me enough money, I will build a detector that will tell you several days in advance when it's going to go off. Nice. And what is that detector going to be? Well, it's going to be the biggest, baddest neutrino detector that's ever been been built on earth right now we've been super clever we meaning physicists collectively not me have built enormous detectors using cubic miles of seawater or or ice the ice cube detector for example in, in antarctica a, in antarctica mm -hmm. and a gorgeous detector right near Sicily, a huge underwater detector. And the wrapper Ice Cube goes down there and performs for the scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <okay>. Not. <laughs> but if we could build a detector that was, say, oh, a thousand times the volume, so instead of a mile by a mile by a mile, we'd love to build something that was 10 miles by 10 miles by, by, a, by a few miles at least, um, we'd have a thousand times the sensitivity. Now, why do I care about neutrinos? Well, as the star is right near the end of its lifetime and mm. just about to flash off. It's not just going to burn. Do you burn. see the light? Do you <laughs> see the light? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to burn the carbon into magnesium, the magnesium into heavier elements, all the way up to iron. And you're going to get a great flux of neutrinos coming out of the core of the star in the last few hours, hours. maybe days wow. okay. of the life of the star certainly in the last couple of minutes. And then during the implosion, you're gonna get another blast of neutrinos. Mm. So these will come out of the star before anything else. Okay. But they're and not going the speed of light. They're so not. So why it, so. Doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is that Betelgeuse isn't that far away. We're talking hundreds of light years. We're not talking millions yeah, yeah, or great. billions of yeah, light years okay. away. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the difference between the speed of the neutrinos. Which and, is very fast. Which is very, 99.9, .9, many nines the sp percent the speed of light. The difference in speed between the neutrinos right. and the gravitational radiation. Okay. That will be And that's emitted, going the speed of light. That is moving exactly at the speed of light. And we have something light. that could detect that if it happens. We have several detectors, yeah, at gotcha. least three mm -hmm. up and operating now that are gonna detect those gravitational mm -hmm. waves. Are they all collectively LIGO or is it just the American ones called LIGO? The, they're collectively called the LIGO, LIGO and each one of them has its own name. Okay. There, for example, the Italian one is referred to as Virgo, but 
the the LIGO, if you will, the LIGO assembly right. uh, yeah. is, is the three telescopes. We get the gravitational waves, right. and they will come at the same speed as the explosive light, I presume. They, they're going to precede the light. Oh, because you have the collapse. You have right. the collapse, and then you got to expand again to get big enough to have a photosphere, a radiating oh. surface big enough. So it's going to be tens of minutes to tens of hours before you see it in the optical. This is going to be amazing. So when you'll see them right one right after another, each of these, the sequence of events. So we're going to see the gravitational radiation and the neutrinos arriving almost simultaneously. We may get lucky and see a few of the early neutrinos coming a few seconds or minutes early. That would be just in the last gasps of, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm finished my carbon burning. I'm going to do my magnesium burning. That didn't help me. I'm going to do my, my silicon burn. That helped me even less. I'm going to do my iron burning. So you get more and more frantic. I've never right. seen you imitate a star before. That's that was pretty good. That was, that was it. Good. That, that, that was, was very it. good. That was a dying star right there. <laughs> And so, because well, what he's doing is the star is trying to not uh, die, right? And so it's finding it's every finding possible everything it can do. To it can burn. do, and if it can't, if it's not enough, it's right. going to collapse on there. Down. And so maybe in that last minute, we'll start seeing a neutrino here, another one, another one, another one, and then tens of thousands of them arriving, and that's going to be and the yeah. harbinger that's going to tell us. Supernova, supernova coming, time. supernova's coming from there, that direction. If we have all three detectors. You can three, triangulate back we on We can it. triangulate to about plus or minus a degree. Okay. You know, a little bit more than the area of the full moon on the sky. Yeah, but how many supernova progenitors are in the area of a full moon on the sky? We typically get, you know, uh, I mean, uh, in, a, in a square degree, we've got millions and millions of stars. You don't know which one it is, but if you triangulate back to that one square degree where Betelgeuse is. Ha, if you, Betelgeuse you, in the middle of the thing. Right. That's you smoking pretty much you should go deal. whoop, whoop, right. whoop, whoop, turn on your alarms. So how, br how bright will Betelgeuse get? Because it's already bright. It's like, what is it? It's 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 zeroth magnitude. Is uh, that, what is it? Maybe Plus, minus. Minus one, one, maybe. Something like that. Yeah. It's, it's certainly one of the, you know, 15, 20 brightest stars in the sky. Way okay. brighter than the North yeah. Star. Uh, once brighter. again. Mm -hmm. Right. So right now, currently it's maybe a million times, yes, uh, <laughs> the luminosity of the sun, Okay, but it's going to go to at least 10 billion times. It's going to get at least 10,000 times brighter. Wow. Wow. Which so means that's 15 magnitudes. That, it's be visible in daytime. It's, oh, it's, it's certainly going to be a daytime thing. It's going to compete <gasps> with the full moon for that's brightness. That's great. Probably cast your shadow. No oh question. my gosh. No well, question. Uh, Joel, there you have it, my friend. If you uh, have a neutrino detector, <laughs> uh, you will know exactly when this is going You'll down. You'll know first. <laughs> if you get the neutrinos and you get the gravitational waves at the same time, just know, Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you, honey. <laughs> Betelgeuse is about to kick the bucket and you can watch it. So one, that's super one, cool. One good piece of news. I mean, you, you, you're you headed in, the, in absolutely the right direction. I don't want you scaring anyone, though. <laughs> okay. You don't need to go down to your basement or your sub-basement. Because even though there are going to be lots of high energy neutrinos coming and whacking you, none of them's going to hurt you. Right. There aren't going to be enough gamma rays to fry our ozone layer. Or make you the Hulk. Or make you the Hulk. Or give you a sunburn. So oh. don't worry about that kind of stuff. It's just going to be something ultra cool that you can walk out and see something that really nobody has seen since the 1600s, we had mm. two supernovas well, almost Kepler back had back. one. Was that, how bright was Kepler's supernova? It was also the same kind of brightness. Maybe not quite as bright Did as he, that. In the daytime? Uh, it was seen in the daytime probably for a month or two, mm -hmm. but I got to go check that. Wow. So um, let me ask you both of this then. Uh, the most famous star in the night sky and also reportedly shown during the day the star of Bethlehem. Hmm. Do we have any real record of what that was? Go on, ask the Jewish man about the star of Bethlehem. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so my forefathers <laughs> did not draw a diagram or a map of where it was. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, this only appears in the New Testament. Right. Yeah. Uh, as a star in the east. Star in the east. Um, you yeah. know, that's a little, a little vague. too vague, huh? <laughs> You think? A little, a little too vague, huh? <laughs> a, a little. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and uh. so 
what can we do that is maybe better? Well, we can go back to the people. That's all. That's the best that info so available. Best. That's it. Well, we can try and cross correlate it because while the astronomers in uh, the ancient Holy Land were not quite up to the task, well, yeah. there were three sets of astronomers who were up to the task. And really were doing their jobs on a night by night basis. And these are the imperial astrologers of China, Japan, and Korea. Okay. Who were looking at the sky every night as harbingers. Either of anything, for good, good or bad. Yeah. Good, yeah. good or evil. Yeah. Because clearly the gods were up there. Right. And the emperor was a demigod. Right. So whatever was happening to the gods was affecting the emperor. So we'd better watch out really carefully and write down what was going on. And so from about 300 BC, but certainly from zero BC onwards, there are pretty good nightly records in all three kingdoms. Oh. And the star of 1054, the, uh, what's today, the crab supernovas? The crab nebula. The crab nebula is detailed in great detail. Uh, wonderful detail in all three kingdoms records. Wow. So we know all about it. So we know that it took place, it took place. on July 4th, AD 1054. And astrophysicists to this day celebrate with fireworks. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> if you see a launch of fireworks, that's what that's what's uh, going down. That's so funny. So you'd like to look for a... So they would have had records for sure. If there had been a really bright... Supernova, supernova. Uh -huh. or a really bright nova. Mm -hmm. Bright anything, yeah, sure. sure. A, a bright nova, a nova that's only, say, a um, hundred light years away. Mm -hmm. And there are stars that are capable of becoming novas only a hundred light years away. Uh, that is an easy star that can become brighter than Venus. So not quite a middle of the day, scary you half to death brightness, but still pretty bright. Still pretty bright. Mm -hmm. So you got to go look really carefully at the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean records from say minus 10 to plus 10, yeah. um, you mm -hmm. know, AD, uh, and there is no good candidate. And there's no good yeah. candidate. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And by the way, that. planetariums yeah. historically always had a Christmas show of the star of Bethlehem. And was it a planetary alignment? Was it Venus? Was it this? Was right. it that? And... But it, it really wasn't any of those, right? And that's kind of a disappointing ending to a planetarium <laughs> show. <laughs> and, but we would we got so sick of the show. I mean, it was just not there was no science in it. Yeah. And so in the in the in the parlance of planetarium, you know what we call it? The war on Christmas? No. <laughs> 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 no, it was tradition. People come to see that, and they go to the Rockettes. Right. And that was that would be that the holiday kind of, thing. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, no, but it, was, it became those the, the SOB show. SOB standing for. Star Bethlehem. Ah, <laughs> there you go. So we now have the technology. <laughs> Astronomers now have the technology to once and, all, once and for all answer the question. Okay. And I'm going to tell you how you heard it here first. All right. Using the kind of telescope I described, the one that found the Wait, super what question shell, are we answering now? Was there a star? Star Beth? Was there a transient? Was there a bright nova or supernova? Right. Within, say, 10 years uh -huh. of zero AD. Yes. And we can actually answer that question now mm -hmm. quite definitively. And within five to 10 years, certainly within 10 years, we're going to be able to give you that answer quite definitively. Because you could. Uh, because you are looking right now. Because oh. you're going to. Because it, I mean, if it was something that ex exploded, you'd be able to see the remnant right. that's 2,000 yeah. years old. And we're going to be able to track the expansion. Yes. And then track the expansion backwards. Right. To see when it so went you will off. know you will know for a fact. Oh my gosh! And see, this is the cool thing about uh, astrophysics then... because it comes with receipts. You know <laughs> what I mean? You cannot bullshit. <laughs>